I invite you to turn in your Bibles now to the book of Isaiah, chapter 63. And we'll be reading together the first 14 verses. And when you get there, would you rise out of reverence for God's holy word? Isaiah chapter 63. Hear the word of God. Who is this who comes from Edom in crimson garments from Basra? He who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone and from the people's. No one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood was splattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation, and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness to the house of Israel, that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely, and he became their savior. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he turned to be their enemy, and himself fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old of Moses and his people. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put in the midst of them his Holy Spirit? Who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses? Who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name? Who led them through the depths? Like a horse in the desert they did not stumble. Like livestock that go down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. So you led your people to make for yourself a glorious name. This is the fearsome word of the Lord. You may be seated. I don't know about you, but this morning, Deacon Brendan rocked my world. I have grown up for 41 years thinking the joy to the world was a Christmas song. But as we sung it together, I realized he was very much right. There's nothing in that song that is specifically tied to Christmas, and it can be just as applied to Christ's second coming as it is to his first. So I, I thank you, brother. That was, that was a blessing and a surprise. When he said, we're going to sing Joy of the World, I was like a little skeptical, but I was like, okay, well, we'll let him do it. But he was right, and thank you for that. Over the last couple of months, as you know, we have been seeking to know the God in whom we live and move and have our being through learning more about Him, knowing Him in His perfections. God is sovereign over all, the absolute ruler who rules absolutely over absolutely everything. God is eternal without beginning or end and above time. God is immutable. He never changes, for He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is omnipresent, everywhere at the same time, omniscient, Knowing the end from the beginning and everything in between. Um, and he's omnipotent. His power is without limit. God is self-existent and holy. He is self-sufficient and set apart from all creation. God is good and righteous. And as we saw last week, God is truth. And it's not enough just to know things about God. We want to apply what we're learning about him to our daily walk with him. So that our personal relationship with him will deepen to greater intimacy. It ought to be our highest goal in life. And our greatest aspiration to know God more. 
And every morning we ought to be waking up with the desire and yearning and longing to know God more. For that is what we were created for, and that is what we were designed for. Let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am Yahweh, who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares Yahweh. And two Sundays ago, we began looking at the second part of knowing God, knowing Him in His love and His justice and His righteousness. And we began with the last category in that list. We began with His righteousness and His goodness. God is good and He is righteous. That is, He is perfectly good. Everything God says is good. Everything God does is good. Everything God makes is good. Everything that comes forth from God is good. And today we're going to look at that second category in that list from Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24. The second category there is that God takes delight in justice. God is a just God. He practices justice in the earth. And he takes delight in justice. But you know, God's justice is not like human justice. Human justice is but a pale and dirty reflection of God's justice. For while we do in this world, we attempt to uphold justice, it's always tainted by sin in this broken world. And so we complain that our justice system is broken in this nation, but it's always been broken. It was never truly whole in the first place. The innocent are punished, the guilty are acquitted, Lesser crimes are punished more harshly than they should be. Greater crimes are punished less severely than they ought. It's all just a hot mess. But we as human beings still strive for justice, as broken as it is, because we were made in the image of a just God. But in contrast with God's, or with human justice rather, God's justice is absolutely perfect. It is tuned to the finest degree. It is completely and utterly just. If God is light, and there is no darkness at all in Him, then God is just, and there is no justice in Him, uh, injustice in Him at all. The symbol of justice from ancient times has been a pair of scales. Not modern scales like we have, and often avoid, but the old-fashioned kind of scales where coins were put in the one cup and then standardized weights were put in the other cup and the scales showed if they were balanced or not. And the key element of that whole system of those scales was the weights. If you wanted to cheat your client, all you had to do was put lighter weights in your scales so that you could get a little bit more money out of them. And this is why God makes a point of saying in His law, that he commands just measurements. Listen to Leviticus 19.35. You shall do no wrong in judgment. In measures of length or or weight or quantity, you shall have just balances, that means scales, just weights, a just ephah and a just hin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And one time wasn't enough. Another time in the law, in Deuteronomy 25, God says again, you shall not have in your bag Two kinds of weights, a large one and a small one. You shall not have in your house two kinds of measures, a large one and a small one. A full and fair weight you shall have. A full and fair measure you shall have. That your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Listen to a couple verses from the book of Proverbs. A false balance or a false scale is an abomination to the Lord. But a just weight is his delight. Again, unequal weights and unequal measures are both alike an abomination to the Lord. So why are true and honest scales so important to God anyway? Because he is just. And he commands his people to be just in their dealings. But but true justice, true fairness must always be measured against something. Justice goes in one side of the cup, but what is in the counterweight that goes in the other cup? 
And that's the key question that the world never asks when talking about justice. Or the world may ask that question, but they can never supply the right answer. What goes in the other cup? Because true justice is measured against God himself. Against his righteousness. Against his goodness. Against his fairness. Against his holiness. And that's why God's justice is absolutely perfect. When we stand before God, we will be placed in the scales on one side of the balance. But on the other side of the scales will not be our good deeds. And it won't be our bad deeds. And it won't be another person. Was I better or worse than Mother Teresa? Or was I better or worse than Genghis Khan? No, on the other side of the balance will be God's own capital R righteousness. That's what I'm going to be measured against. That's what you're going to be measured against. Be perfect, said Jesus Christ, as your heavenly Father is perfect. We are measured against God himself. For all have sinned, declares the Apostle Paul in Romans 3.23, and fall short of the glory of God. But have you ever asked yourself the question in that verse, what is it that's shining so gloriously that we fall short of? It's God's own perfect righteousness that shines forth in gloriousness, and we fall far short of that standard. True justice is always measured against God's own righteous character. Whatever is in balance with God's righteousness is justice. Whatever is not in balance with God's righteousness is injustice. And this morning we're also uh, going to talk about the wrath of God. For God's wrath is the necessary response and consequence to sin. If there were no sin in this world, there would be no wrath from God. But because this world is soaked and saturated with sin, then the just response of the perfectly just God is wrath and anger and fury against that sin. And so let us turn to the scriptures to see how the living God is the God of justice. And then we will consider verses that talk about his wrath over sin when his justice is broken. We begin with the words of Abraham as he stood with God looking over Sodom and Gomorrah. And as Abraham tried to convince God to spare those cities, he acknowledged God's justice with these words. He says to God, far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked so that the righteous fare as the wicked do. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? That's that key question there. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Then in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses teaches this song to the children of Israel. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. In the book of Psalms, David declares that the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. The prophet Isaiah agrees in Isaiah 5.16. He says, but the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice. And the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness. And again in Isaiah 30, Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you, for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. And the prophet Zephaniah also agrees. He says, The Lord within Jerusalem is righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. Every dawn he does not fail. But the unjust knows no shame. And we have been reminded each week from Jeremiah 9.24 that justice is one of the things that God takes delight in doing. Well, here are some verses that say that God loves justice. Not only does he delight in it, he loves it. Mm -hmm. Psalm 33, God loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Psalm 37, the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. 
They are preserved forever. But the children of the wicked shall be cut off. And then in Isaiah 61, God declares in his own voice, he says, I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. He's talking about his people there. Now these are only a few verses from scripture that point to God's justice. If we went through the whole list of verses, we'd be here all morning. But let it stand as established, according to the Bible, that God is a God of justice. But what happens when God's justice is transgressed? What is God's perfectly just response to sin, rebellion, and disobedience, and transgression against Him when sinners thumb their noses at Him? And laugh at his commands. Does God just, just wink at it? Does he just laugh and wave his hand, chuckling to himself? Sinners will be sinners. No. According to scripture, the just response to sin is always the wrath of God. In the book of Deuteronomy, the children of Israel... Stand on the edge of the promised land and Moses renews the covenant with them because they are a new generation. They're ready to enter. And Moses, his last act before he dies, he renews the covenant with this new generation. And in Deuteronomy 28, through Moses, God outlines the blessings if they obey and the curses if they disobey him. <clears throat> and in this chapter, I love the math. Well, I'm not good at math. Uh, I love the numbers here. Because in that chapter, chapter 28, Moses spends 14 verses describing in wonderful terms the blessings that God will pour out on his people if they would only obey him and keep his commands. And it goes on and on and on for 14 verses of blessing. Can you believe it? Imagine that. I encourage you to, this week, go home and read it. 14 verses of God's blessings. That's a lot of verses, isn't it? It's a lot of beautiful detail. 14 whole verses describing the wonders of God's blessing. And you've noticed I've been emphasizing the number 14, so you know something's coming, don't you? And then, for the next 54 verses in that chapter, Moses describes in excruciating detail the wrath that God is going to bring down upon their heads if they disobey him. So that's 14 verses of blessing, 54 verses of wrath. And this is what Moses says in the 63rd verse of that chapter. Listen to this. And as the Lord took delight in doing you good and multiplying you, so the Lord will take delight in bringing ruin upon you and destroying you. Oh, I'm sure you're thinking, I didn't know that verse was in the Bible. You see, brothers and sisters, this is a sobering reality. That God takes delight in displaying his loving mercy. But God also takes delight in displaying his wrath. For it brings glory to him as he demonstrates his perfect and absolute justice. Nahum the prophet declares, The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. Jeremiah the prophet agrees, The Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At His wrath, the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure His indignation. This is what God declares through Ezekiel the prophet. He says, As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I will be King over you. And again, therefore I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have returned their way upon their heads, declares the Lord God. And you may be thinking to yourself right now, well, pastor, those are all quotes from the Old Testament. But, and the Old Testament is full of God's wrath. We already know that. But the New Testament is full of God's love, right? 
But listen to this from the book of Romans in the New Testament. Romans 1.18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And then in Romans chapter 2, the same book, Paul points the finger at each of us personally that each of us is accumulating the wrath of God against us for our sin against him. It says, because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. And again, Ephesians 5 verse 6 says, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And in the Gospel of John, we learn that God's wrath actually remains upon us, hanging over our heads, waiting to rain down upon us in full fury, unless we believe in the Son. John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The Apostle Paul in Romans also confirms that it's the blood of Jesus alone that saves us from God's wrath. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. But what is this coming wrath of God that the Bible talks about both in the Old Testament and the New Testament? What is this day of wrath that is coming upon the earth? Well, here's a few verses. Psalm 21 says, You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in His wrath, and fire will consume them. Isaiah 13, two verses here. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. And again, therefore I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. And Zephaniah 1.18, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. For a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. And in the book of Revelation, it describes the day of God's wrath, the day of judgment. And let me just share with you a couple of verses. Because in chapter 14 of Revelation, it describes how all human beings are gathered up and thrown into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Revelation 14 verse 19 says, So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the great harvest of the earth and threw it, into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Now let us remember what a wine press is. It was, it was how the ancient world made wine. They put all the grapes together in a big wide vat, and then people would get in there, and they'd step, and they'd stomp around and crush all the grapes, and then the juices would flow out of holes in the bottom so that the juice could be uh, collected. And so in the book of Revelation, here is this image of all human beings, they're the grapes, being thrown into the wine press of God's wrath. But the question is, who is going to step in there and stomp around in the wine press of God's wrath? And the book of Revelation actually gives us the answer there. In chapter 19, listen to this, starting in verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. Whoa! So the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is the agent of God's wrath on the day of judgment. Jesus will be the one to crush every enemy of God under his feet as he treads the winepress of God's wrath. This means that God the Son delights in justice 
just as much as God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. But wait just a minute, Pastor. Come now. I thought Jesus was loving. I thought he was a gentle Savior. Didn't he say in John 12, 47, If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge them. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Doesn't it say that? Well, yes, it does. Indeed, in his first coming, Jesus was a gentle and loving Savior who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. But that's the first coming of Jesus Christ. Let us be very clear. There are two comings. The second coming of Jesus Christ will be very different. For at his second coming, he comes with judgment and righteousness and wrath. Listen to Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from the other, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And so now that we have biblically established the perfect justice of God, and how his just response to sin against him is wrath, let us now turn to think Think about how to apply these perfections of God in our daily walk with Him. And I came up with a list of six applications. That's not an exhaustive list, and don't worry, we'll go through those pretty quickly. But first of all, God is not sad over sin and injustice. Secondly, we need stiff reminders of God's justice. We need that. Thirdly, the wrath of God is good, for it comes from a good God. Fourthly, God's wrath must fall. Fifthly, the future day of judgment means that we can take comfort in the present injustice that we see. And six, the just God justifies sinners on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ. So let's go through those briefly. Have you noticed nowadays, very often we hear about how God is sad over sin? Have you noticed that? How God's heart breaks over the injustice in this world. That God sorrows over the wickedness in this world. That God grieves over sin. God is disappointed with sinners. He's saddened. He's disheartened. He's just dismayed all the time. But whenever I hear that kind of language, that God is sad or grieved or sorrowful over sin and injustice in the world, I wonder to myself, what kind of Bible are you reading? That's not really in the Bible that I'm reading. In the Bible that I read, God is not sad over sin. He is furious and enraged over sin. We see this over and over and over again. In the Bible that I read, God says that if you sin against him, he's going to stomp on your head. And then he's going to stomp on your kid's head. And on his kid's head and on his kid's head. God says that if you sin against me, I'm going to blast you into eternity. If you sin against me, I'm going to send you to a place of suffering and continual torment, drowning in a lake of fire and sulfur and brimstone forever and ever and ever and ever with no way out ever. And as human beings, we don't like hearing that. We don't like thinking about God's perfect justice. And how terrifying his wrath is. We want to switch that channel as quick as we can. It makes us uncomfortable. It makes us squirm. You know why it does? Because we don't really view our sin as being all that bad. It's bad. Yeah, we know that. It's bad. But it's not that bad. I mean, come on, God. But if we could truly understand just how heinous and how horrible our sin was in the eyes of God, we would understand why his response is wrath. And in the Bible, there is a section known as the prophetical books from the book of Isaiah to the book at the end of the Old Testament 
the book of Malachi. That's five major prophets along with 12 minor prophets. So that's 17 books of the Bible there in this section. And do you know what the main theme of all of these prophetical books is? It's the wrath of God over sin against him. And yes, there are also themes of redemption and salvation and grace in those books as well, but the overarching theme is the wrath of God. And I think maybe that's why we don't like to read those books very much. Because chapter after chapter after chapter in the prophetical books is how God is going to pour out his wrath upon his disobedient people Israel and also upon all the nations who rebel against him. And then we may even begin to ask ourselves, well, why are these 17 books even in the Bible? Like such a downer. Couldn't God have left those out? Did he really have to tell us about how great his wrath over sin is over and over and over again ad nauseum? And the answer is yes. Absolutely yes. Because we as human beings are like sheep. And sheep are really dumb. Sheep are forgetful and helpless. And they need to be reminded over and over again not to stray from the shepherd and why it's so important to stay with him. We need 17 books of the Bible to reinforce and hit home to our dumb little sheepy minds that God's wrath is something that should fill us with terror. So that we despair of ourselves and we cry out in desperation for a Savior. And those 17 books of prophecy are actually paving the way for the gospel. Because Isaiah says wrath. And Jeremiah says wrath, and Ezekiel says wrath, and Micah says wrath, and Nahum says wrath, and Amos says wrath, and Zechariah says wrath, and Malachi says wrath. Also that Matthew can say grace in Jesus Christ. And here's the thing, brothers and sisters. The wrath of God is good. Why? Why? Because God's wrath comes from a good God. Everything God says, makes, and does is good. And that includes his wrath. In our world, when justice is carried out, we say that is good. When a murderer is convicted and goes to prison or to the death penalty, we know that is good because it is just. And we rejoice in the performance of justice. But how much more good is it then? when perfect justice is carried out by God in his good wrath. The problem is that we like it when justice is carried out on everybody else except ourselves. For ourselves, we have excuses and reasons and justifications for our behavior, for why justice should not fall upon our heads. Right, that guy really deserves it. But me, no. But perfect justice, the Bible promises, will come for every sinner who has disobeyed and rebelled against his or her creator. And that's why we desperately need a Savior. God hasn't just given us Jesus and says, it's optional if you want to take him or not. We desperately need a Savior. Did you know that in all of human history, there are two days, just two days, in which God's perfect justice is done. Just two days. The first day has already happened, and the second day is still to come. The first day on which God's perfect justice was carried out was on a Friday in April in the year 33 AD. This was when the darkness of God's wrath was gathered around a hill just outside the city of Jerusalem, and the fullness of God's wrath was poured out upon a man, excuse me, Hanging from a couple pieces of wood. Justice was completely carried out on that day. As the wrath over all the sin of every elect believer was poured out on Jesus. And then satisfied and then paid for by his perfect righteousness. So God's wrath over Noah's sin was poured out upon Jesus. And God's wrath over Abraham's sin was poured out upon Jesus. 
And God's wrath over Moses' sin and his wrath over David's sin and Sarah's sin and Miriam's and Deborah's and Isaiah's and Daniel's is all poured out upon Jesus. And God's wrath over Peter's sin and James's and John's and the other apostles was poured out on Jesus. And that of Paul and Barnabas and Timothy and Priscilla and Mary Magdalene and all the early church. And God's wrath over Augustine's sin and Luther's sin and Calvin's sin and Wesley's sin and Whitfield's sin, that too was poured out upon Jesus. And you know what? God's wrath for your sin was poured out upon Jesus, if you're a believer in Him today. And His wrath for my sin was poured out upon Jesus on that best of Fridays. Because of the perfect and absolute nature of God's justice, His wrath must fall. It must fall. And His good wrath falls on one of those two days. It either falls upon Jesus on that good Friday 2,000 years ago, or it will fall on that day in the future which is known as the day of judgment. For God has promised in His revealed word that there is coming a day, the day of days, the final day. And on that day, God will execute His perfect justice through His Son, Jesus Christ, who will sit on the great white throne of judgment and judge every single human being who has ever lived. And the wrath of God will fall on every sinner who has ever sinned against, his holy, uh, against the holy and righteous God. For God's wrath for sin can only fall on one of two places. It will either fall fully on my own head, or it will fall fully on the head of my perfect substitute, who takes my place under the eternal, furious waterfall of God's good wrath. His wrath must fall. So then, God's wrath for my sin will either fall on my head on the day of judgment, or it is already fallen on the head of his perfect son, Jesus Christ, two millennia ago. That's it. That is it. There is no other way that God's justice and wrath can be satisfied. And the thing is, is if his wrath falls on my head, it will never ever be satisfied. For it will burn continually for all eternity. God is eternal, and therefore his wrath is eternal. So then what is the only thing that can quench eternal wrath? Only a perfect substitute can snuff out and quench God's just wrath. Now sometimes when we hear about the perfect justice of God, we are confused and dismayed. Because we hear that from God's word, and then we look out the window and say, wait a second, something's a little off here. Because we see so much injustice happening all around us in this world, even sometimes happening to us. And we ask ourselves, well then, where is this perfect God of perfect justice anyway? Why isn't he doing anything about all this wickedness in the here and now? Because a whole lot of sin seems to be passing by without being addressed. The wicked seem to prosper while the righteous are trampled upon. But you know, these questions were already asked in the Bible itself. Job cried these things. Asaph the psalmist wondered about this. Jeremiah the prophet raised this question, as did Habakkuk the prophet. And in every case, the answer from God is consistently the same. Trust in me and wait for my justice, because it will surely come. All the evil and wickedness in this world, all the injustice we see all around us, even the wrongs that happen to us, all these things will be brought to true and perfect judge, justice on the day of judgment. God will allow nothing to pass by without just recompense. And so as believers, we look to the day of judgment as God's final word on justice. And we trust that he, the judge of all the earth, will do right. But the same judge will also narrow his gaze upon us on that great and terrifying day. And he will bring judgment upon you and me as well. 
It's all well and good to grieve about the injustice and wickedness in the world around us. But how often do we grieve about the injustice and wickedness in our own hearts? And that's why the Bible says that we need to be justified in the eyes of God. To be justified means to be declared, to be declared just and right and righteous in the sight of God. But really, how, how on earth can a sinner be justified before a perfectly just and wrathful judge? Well, only through faith in a perfectly just Savior, the God-man Jesus Christ. If we are in Christ, if we belong to Christ by faith, if Jesus has his arm around me as my big brother, then God, the just and wrathful judge, looks at Jesus, the perfect Savior, and a big smile comes over the perfect judge's face. And he looks over at us who are under the arm of Jesus. You're with my beloved son with whom I'm so pleased. Well, then, I love you too. I will count my perfect son righteousness as your perfect righteousness. We are justified by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. There is nowhere else that we can find justification in the eyes of the just and holy God. And so the Bible says in Romans 8 verse 1, there is now no condemnation whatsoever for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's like saying, there is no wrath for God, or from God, for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Jesus through faith in His name, then the wrath of God is no longer hanging over your head. The wrath of God no longer remains on you, for you have believed in the name of the Son of God. Imagine for a moment that you are standing before a raging forest fire that has surrounded you on all sides. And its flames reach up to the sky. Its heat hinges, uh, singes your clothes. Its, its devastating power forces you to your knees. You can't breathe. The heavy smoke burns your eyes and your lungs. And, and you are about to be engulfed in that forest fire. When over the mountain comes the sound of an airplane. It's Jesus Christ. Bringing the biggest load of fire retardant ever. And he swoops low over that forest fire. And he drops the retardant. And he, he puts the whole thing out. He quenches the fire completely. What was just a raging forest fire is now a smoking wasteland of black sticks. There is now no condemnation or wrath whatsoever for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the wonderful thing about God's perfect justice is that it works both ways. God is just to bring his good wrath on those who disobey him. But he is also just to keep his promises. That he will forgive our sin on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ, our perfect substitute. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God's perfect justice condemns sinners. But God's perfect justice also forgives sinners on the basis of Christ's perfection. And I don't know about you, but that sure sounds like good news to me. Let us pray. Father God, to think about your perfect justice and then to think about what happens when your perfect justice is transgressed and, and your just response is wrath, Father, that is overwhelming for us. When we truly begin to unpack what your word reveals about who you are in your perfection and your, your character, Father, we find ourselves shaking like a leaf and trembling before you once again. 
For you are not a God who is saddened over our sin. You are a God who is wrathful over our sin. And you have revealed in so many ways, over and over again, in a variety of images and, and in all the prophets and in all the books of the New Testament, over and over and over again, that your response to sin is wrath. And, and Father, somehow we're deaf to that because we just don't want to see it. We don't want to accept it. But the Bible clearly reveals that your perfect justice means that your wrath must fall. And Father, that could have been it. You could have just displayed your glorious justice upon us and sent us all to hell. And that would have been, you would have been no less loving, no less good. But Father, in your loving kindness, you also provided one way out from under your wrath. One and only one way to quench your wrath, to satisfy your justice. And you made him available in the, in the, in the uh, presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done. For he is a perfect Savior who has offered a perfect offering that eternally quenches your eternal wrath. And Father, that is how we know your love. So both your justice and your love are on full display in the cross because you poured out your wrath for our sin upon Jesus Christ on that day. So your justice was on display, but at the same time your love was on display because you provided that perfect and spotless lamb that everyone who places their hands upon that lamb and transfers their sin through faith onto the head of that perfect lamb can know that that sacrifice is perfect and wipes away all sin so that we can know the wrath of God is no longer hanging over us. There is now no condemnation whatsoever for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so, Father, today may we tremble in fear before you once again. Those areas of our lives, if we're believers, if there are those areas of those lives that are are sinful and not being put to death in our lives, let us seek to do that by the power of your Spirit working within us. Father, may we grow in love for you. Because the more we understand how great our sin was and how offensive it was to you, the greater we will understand of what you have done for us in Jesus Christ. Yes, amen. The more we we'll want to love him, the more we we'll want to serve him, the more we we'll want to praise him, the more we we'll want to live for him. May that be the case in each of our lives so that we may be a church that just exists to glorify your name. Father, work in our hearts today, I pray. That when we consider your justice and consider how great your wrath is, we realize how great the gospel is, how great Jesus Christ is, because, wow, he is great. For someone to be able to quench the eternal wrath of God when he said it is finished, it is truly finished. Mm -hmm. Father, he is great and beautiful. Let us love him more. All the praise and glory goes to you now, Father. And I do pray for those who are here listening to this message today. I pray for those who have not yet given their lives to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Who have not bowed their knee to Jesus Christ and surrendering their lives to him in faith and repentance. I pray for them today. I pray that you've given them ears to hear and hearts that are open to receive. I pray that in the quietness of their own hearts today, they would consider these things, they would tremble before the wrath of the God that they have spurned for their whole lives. That they would put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ alone, because only he can save. And Father, for those of us who are believers already, let us continue to tremble before you. If we have become sloth or, or apathetic or lazy in our Christian lives, Father, let us repent today. Mm. That because of the gospel and how beautiful it is, how, how great you have saved us, Father. Yes, Lord. When we were walking that wide and spacious road that leads to destruction, mm. you put us on the narrow path, and that was all you're doing. Father, imbue us with that sense of your greatness 
how wonderful the gospel is once again, so that we may get back on the right track of loving you and serving you yes. and bring glory to your name. Mm. So in Jesus' name we pray these things. <coughs> Amen. Mm.